Good morning, church. How you guys doing? Uh, my name is Derek Shadow. I'm fairly new to the FMCC fam. Uh, I work for one of the community partners uh, for Mars Community Church, Ride Nature. If you guys know Ride Nature. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm the action sports director over there, uh, heading up the skateboard churches and all those good things. But I'm here to bring this scripture reading this morning. So if you guys want to stand for the reading of God's word, uh, today's passage is going to be Luke 15, uh, verses 11 through 31. So let's do this. <clears throat> Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to the father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered all his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out, go back to my father, and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Yeah, make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. But meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard the music and dancing, so he called to one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has, he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, Look, after all these years, I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him? My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Amen. Thanks, Derek. Well, this morning, you can have a seat. We are... Entering into a very familiar parable, the parable that is entitled The Prodigal Son. And before we dive in, what I want us to do is I want us to pause. If you would, close your eyes, and I want you to think about this question. How do you view God? So for a moment, I want you to sit, close your eyes, I want you to think, how do you view God? What is his character? What are his attributes? All right. I think, I think it's too easy for us, especially in our culture today, to create these misconceptions about who God is and what his character is, what his attributes are. And I think that our culture has distorted the person, not only of Jesus, but also of God the Father. And I think for us, it's very easy to uh, see him. And for me, growing up, I don't know about you, but I kind of saw him as a guy playing whack-a-mole. You guys know that game? So I, I felt like I was, if I messed up, if I did something wrong, God was just waiting to hit me as I popped up, right? I, if I can do good and be good, then I'm kind of in the hole, right? Like he doesn't really know I exist. 
but then if I do something wrong, all of a sudden my head's up and he can just like tee off on me, right? And that's kind of my vision that I had. I thought God was this overbearing uh, commander, general, who was just waiting for me to mess up and with a golf club, he's just ready, right? Boom, hit me, right? Every time I did something wrong. That was the, the, the perception that I had growing up. I think for some of us, we can see him as, as a genie, right? If we, we just go to him and we ask, can, do this, do that, I want this, I want that. And, and it's kind of like we have these three wishes. And I had a roommate in college that, that had this perception. One of the things he said was, I don't pray often for myself because I'm afraid I'm going to use up the blessings that God has for me. He's like, so I really want to wait for the things that I really need before actually asking him. What was that? He thought he had three wishes. He thought, I'm going to go throughout my life. I had these three wishes, and I didn't want to waste them. So I'm just not going to pray for myself unless something really big comes up, or I really, really want something. Or, like I said, an army general, someone who's just dictating orders, do this, do that, and I just have to obey. And if I stay in line and I obey, then, uh, then I'm good. We're, we're, we're in, in good standing with one another. And so we're going into this parable with all these perceptions of who we think God is and what he's done. And I want to make sure that we see God for truly what the Bible says. See, we believe here at FMCC that this word, the Bible, is inerrant, meaning without error. That this is the word of God. It's inspired by the Holy Spirit, written down for us, for you and I. Now, we would submit and understand that there are certain things that we find in the English Bible that were put there by man so that we can navigate the scriptures easier and better. So there are chapters and verses. And there are page numbers. Those weren't in the original text. But for us, those are put there so that we can navigate the scriptures better. So I say to you, Luke 15, verse 11, you know where to go. And so if you have a Bible, please grab one. There are Bibles along the edge of the rows. Uh, if you want to grab one, we'd love for you to hold the word of God in your hand. Uh, but we also submit that there are certain things in scripture, uh, like the headings, that are also part of the navigation techniques and tools that we have created in order for us to read the word of God easier. And I would say that, that the heading on this parable um, is a little bit misinforming because I don't believe that the focus is on a wayward son, a prodigal son. See, look at verse 11 with me. And he said, this is Jesus, there was a man who had two sons. Where is the focus in that verse? On the man, not the two sons. And so already going in by the headings that we put in the English language on this thing, we can come in with these misperceptions about what God is trying to tell us through this passage. So we need to sit with the word of God and read what God has for us and the people of that time, especially that Jesus is telling a story on this. So we have to look at it in context. See, we're looking at this man, the joyful father, and who he is and what he's done. So in context, we have to go back to chapter 15, verses 1 through 3, to see why Jesus would even share this particular story. So if you would, go back up, Luke 15, verse 1. And he says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. Tax collectors in that day uh, were not looked very highly upon. So they were people that were oppressing their own people. And so they would work for the government that was oppressing the Jews and different people, and they were hired by the oppressors to go collect taxes. And then what they would do is they would screw their own people out of money. And so they would go over to Chris Palmer and say, hey, Chris, you owe 100 denarii, but he only owed 60, and the tax collector... And so, so the tax collectors in that day were not looked very highly upon. And then the sinners, right, they even just, they just throw it out there. They don't even say what type, it's just sinners. People that were, were dirty, disgusting, people that no one really liked, people that were uh, frivolous in their living. So the tax collectors and the sinners, they were drawing near to hear Jesus. They were drawing near to have a relationship with the person, Jesus Christ. And the Pharisees and the scribes, those were the religious leaders of that day. People that were looked very highly upon. And so the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the scribes, they grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners? And not only does he receive them, but he actually eats with them? To eat with somebody in that day was super intimate. 
To eat with somebody in that day was, was, was a beautiful thing to get together and share a meal, share a table. That's one of the reasons why we have tables here, because it creates a better form of intimacy with people. And so he's, they're, saying, they're looking at they're going, what is this guy thinking? He's eating with sinners? He's building relationships with people that are outcasts, people that are dirty, that do wrong things? And so Jesus tells them, Three stories, three parables, three analogies. One of this lost coin. A woman loses a coin. And when she finds it, she celebrates. And then of the lost sheep. When, when the shepherd loses a sheep, he leaves the 99 and goes after the one. And when he finds it, he calls his friends in and they celebrate. And then he goes into this parable. And in verse 11, he says, there's a man who has two sons. See, each one of these stories ends in celebration. Each one of these stories ends in joy. And so my hope for us this morning is that we would begin to see God as a joyful Father. A joyful Father. So Jesus had a mission. And that mission was given to him by his Father. Look with me. Uh, you don't have to turn there. It's going to go up on the screen. Luke 19.10 says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Matthew 18.11 For the Son of Man has come to save the lost. John 5.19 Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. I think too often we can separate the Father and the Son. Too often we can think of them as two completely different beings with two completely different attributes and two completely different characters and two different personalities. And so we see sometimes God the Father as this righteous judge who's strong and will wipe out nations. And then Jesus the, 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 the carpenter, the gentle man who came down to earth to love us. And so I think there's this conflicting thing in our culture where we go, all right, you know, God the Father is strong, and, and then it's like, oh, Jesus is so nice and loving. Let's just, let's just be so kind to everybody. And we have to realize that they're the same being. Jesus' character and God's character are all the same. And what we see there in John 5, 19 is that Jesus can't be loving if his Father's not loving. Jesus can't be joyful if his father's not joyful. Jesus cannot be accepting if his father is not accepting. We can't separate these things. Yes, there is justice. Yes, there is righteousness. Yes, there is holiness. There is truth. And there is love. And there is mercy. And there is grace. And all of that describes both God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We cannot begin to separate these things. And so when we're going into this passage, we have to see that the Father gave the Son a mission. And in this story, it's not just the younger son that was lost. That's why I think it's maybe a little misinforming when we're reading our headings. Because we can go into this just thinking, okay, the focus is on the younger son. But let's go into this together. You excited? I'm pumped. This is so... This is so cool. All right, verse 12. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me a share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. I think we could miss what the son is doing here. That kind of just sounds like, oh yeah, okay, this is... The, the younger son is asking his father to commit legal suicide. Inheritance was only given upon death. So the father would have died and he would have given an inheritance to both of his sons. And in that culture, I mean, we could, we could go on talking about this. This is not the focus, but a lot of times the older son would get more. And so the older son would get about two-thirds of the property and the younger son about one-third. And so there's an inheritance. That's what we have to look at. It doesn't matter how much. And the father splits it between the two. However that may look, he gives some to the younger son and some to the older son. Who asked for the inheritance? The younger son. But the father does what he says, and he, he commits this legal suicide and actually separates his inheritance. 
See, this younger son is beginning to treat his dad like a genie, right? This is what I want. You can provide something for me. Give me this. And you're, you're of no value to me outside of your money, your stuff, your things. So just give me what's owed to me. And then in verses 13 through 16, the younger son sets off. This is a few days later. He gathers his things. I'm guessing that the aura of that uh, household for those couple of days was pretty rough. Parents, imagine your kids looking at you. I'm just thinking about my daughter, Selah, saying to me, Dad, I wish you were dead. Give me your stuff. And a couple days later, she just packs up her belongings, just takes off. I mean, how much life and how much love and how much uh, you pour out yourself into your kids for them to just look at you and tell you, I don't need you. Give me my stuff. And they take off. So he goes, he sits off, and he has a good time. He goes and he, he does everything he's ever dreamed of. He goes to Disney World. He goes to Las Vegas. He, he squanders all that his dad has worked for, everything that was coming to him to set him up for the rest of his life. Gone. On $10,000 a night bottles of whatever they buy. Right? Just, just gone. And then he goes and he gets a job feeding pigs. He finds some kind of farm, and he says, hey, can I help out? I just need to make some ends meet. There's a famine in the land. And he goes, and he enters into these pig pens, pouring these pods into their feeding troughs. These pods, I actually I have some in my backyard. They're the things that lay all over the ground in certain seasons. These, these pods that, that they would uh, get off trees, and they would dry up, and then they'd feed them to these pigs. And a lot of times those pig pens were were dirty and messy and muddy, and it was just kind of slop. All the leftovers, they just gave to the pigs. And this was good for the pigs. Why? Because then they would get fat, and then they'd eat the pigs. And so he goes, and he starts feeding them, and his body is longing to stick his face in the trough. He just wants to eat this slop that is before him that he's feeding these pigs, but he can't because he doesn't have enough money, and he's not even worth that. And so in verse 17 through 19, he comes to his senses. And what he does is he begins to rehearse his speech. Look at verse 17. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I will perish here with hunger. So I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And so I just I want you to vi visualize this. He is dirty and filthy and muddy and smells like pig feces. And he is sweaty and he is hungry. And he picks himself up and he's like, man, if I could just get back to my dad's house, maybe there's a a piece of bread that he'll give me and have a little bit of mercy on me. Maybe I could be a hired hand on his, on his, on his farm. And so, so he picks himself up and then he's going and he's rehearsing. Father, I've sinned against you in heaven. Father, I've sinned against you in heaven. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Father, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Right, he wants to get this right. He's got one shot at this, right? One shot to maybe get a little bit of bread, maybe to get cleaned up. Right, Father, uh, just make me a servant. Make me a servant. Make me a servant. And what does the Bible say? Verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion. While he was still a long way off, the father saw him and had compassion. The father waiting and watching for his son to return. I just can visualize the, the father at the dinner table moving his chair just so he had a vision of the road coming in towards his property. Just watching and then after dinner walking out on the porch hoping to catch a glimpse of his son in the distance. And so he sees a figure that's way off in the distance and it could be anybody, it could be anything but not to the father. Not to the father. See, he knows his son. He knows his son intimately. He knows how he walks. He knows his son's trot. 
He knows how his son's arms moved. He knows that when his son is sweating, he uses his entire arm to remove the sweat from his face. He knows his son. And he's seeing this this thing in the distance, and he goes, that's my boy. That's my son. And so what does he do? He takes these these robes that they would have worn. He he girds up his loins, right? He takes all these these things, and and he bunches them up, and he starts to run. Not something a dignified father would have done in that generation, in that season in that culture, picks up his robes and just goes for it. Starts to run out to his son. And while he was still a long way up, the father saw him and felt compassion. He ran to him and embraced him and kissed him in his slop, in his filthiness, in his dirtiness, in his smelliness, grabbed a hold of him, didn't care that he was full of the feces of pigs, and started kissing his neck, his sweaty, dirty, filthy neck, And what happens? The son begins to rehearse his speech, right? He begins to say the speech that he has been practicing. If I could just get this right, if I could just get this right. Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be your son. He stops. The speech that he has prepared so well, it just stops. He's not cut off here. See, we would have seen that. He just stops. The embrace of his father makes him recognize, I'm not even worthy to be called your servant. He's overwhelmed. He finally has realized that he's lost. He has nothing to bring to the table. He realizes, man, I'm not even worthy to be a servant. So he doesn't even have to say it. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. While his father has him embraced, he says to him, the father says to the servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate For my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Man. Like imagine being this son who just picked himself up out of a pig pen and walked back knowing that he said to his dad, I wish you were dead. And then all of a sudden gets embraced by this father. He puts a robe on him and a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet. He goes, let's party. Like, get everybody together. Like, let's go. Music, dancing, dance floor. Like, come on. Get the bull. We're going to ride him around. Right? Like, let's go. Let's get some some good food and and, and drink. And let's be merry. My son was dead, but now he's alive. A beautiful act of unconditional love leading to joy and celebration. Now, hold up. I've got four kids. You know, if one of them did that to me, I would love to say that I would act and respond like this dad did. But I don't often. Most of the time, I'm like, hey, we're going to party. I'm super stoked at your home. But um, you're going to sit in the corner, and you're going to watch us party just so you can think about what you've done. Yeah, right? Like, you're, I'm going to make you watch us while we're partying that you're home, but you need to, you, you need to pay the consequences, right? Because for us, there's consequences to our actions. There's no consequences. Or is there? Let's keep going. So the only one in this story that appears to be thinking logically enters in. Verse 25. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, so his older son is working the field, which he would have done every day, for his father. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he calls to one of the servants and says, what do these things mean? And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him safe back, safe and sound. Hmm. Music and dancing. How do you think the older brother feels at this point? Excited that his younger brother has returned? 
Let me ask this question. Who does all the stuff that they're partying with and that the younger brother's wearing belong to? Go back to the beginning of the story. A man has two sons. The younger son says, give me what is due to me. And so the father splits his inheritance between the older son and the younger son. Although it still would have technically belonged to the, to the father, who does all the stuff that on that farm belong to? The older brother. So he's drawing near and he's looking at the scene and he's going, what's that joker doing with my coat? Like that, that's my coat? Wait, wait, wait. Not my shoes. Oh, I just, those, I've been waiting for those vintage Jordans. Like, not my ring. Man, that, I've been looking at that ring on my dad's finger every single day, every single night, just waiting for the day that it becomes mine. Why is it on his finger? My calf? Like, I've, been, I've been setting up a party for a couple months from now with my friends. He just killed my calf. Think about the mentality that's going on in the older brother. See, he's interacting with his dad like, like a general. Someone to just dictate orders and do things. Let's look at that. Verse 28. He's angry. But he was angry and refused to go in. And so his father came out to him as well, just like he came out to the younger son. And he entreated him. This means begging, appealed to him. But he answers his father, look, for these many years, I have served you. See, in the English language, it, it, we kind of um, minimize what that word actually means. The, the Greek there would actually mean slaved. For all these years, I have been your slave. I never disobeyed your commands, right? He treats his father like this general. You told me what to do, and I did it. What's up? You never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. Think about it. If it was his anyone, if he ever asked his dad for a goat, you think his dad would have given it to him? Yeah, because it was his due. It was his inheritance. But he's like, you never did this. You never did this. I've always done the right thing. But when this son of yours, not my brother, not our family, when this son of yours comes back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed a fattened calf for him? And what does this joyful redemption look like when his father says to him, Son, you are always with me. All that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad with joy. For this, your brother was dead and is alive, and he was lost, and now he is found. We need to see the Father for who he is, the joyful Father, this story of redemption, an invitation to enter into the joy of the Father. Do you view God as a joyful Father? Or like a genie? or general, but a joyful father. See, one son, a prodigal, seeking enjoyment outside of the relationship and protection of his father, leading him to loneliness, depression, emptiness, and hopelessness. He used his dad like a genie, and now he's thinking, my father could never love me, I messed up. But then, but then the other, a prodigal seeking acceptance in his obedience, his progress, and his performance. Leading to feelings of superiority, anger, bitterness, resentment, and fear-based compliance. Any of those things articulate how you interact with God? Loneliness, depression, isolation, Emptiness, hopelessness, or superiority, resentment of others, fear-based compliance. See, the older brother engaged his dad like a general. I'm not sure if my father loves me. Have I done enough? Have I done enough to please him? Done enough to make him want to love me? See, here's the kingdom mystery. 
And this is what I'm so excited about. There's a true older brother that is telling this story. Oh, let's not miss this. There is a true older brother telling this story. I want us to listen because we can't separate God the Father and God the Son. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion. That word compassion is he was moved in the most inward parts. God didn't leave us in the pig slop. Jesus had a mission. The person telling this story had a mission given to him by his father to go after what was lost, to go what, what was after what was in the pig slop, what was broken and hurting and dead, what was lost. And he became flesh. He left his inheritance. The true older brother left all that he had, his kingdom, his throne, and came and wrapped himself in flesh and dwelt among us. And he had the beard ripped from his face. He was beaten and stricken and put on a cross and killed and murdered on our behalf for us. That is what a true older brother would have done. And that's what the true older brother did for you. And he did for me. That he came after us because of the joy of the Father and his delight in you, in me. Didn't care if you're a prodigal in your filth or a prodigal in your righteousness and your holiness. God came to bring us life. Amen? Oh. So Jesus had a mission given to him by God the Father to die so that we might be found. That's the beautiful gospel. That's the kingdom mystery. So we can enter into the joy of our joyful Father. And here's the question that God said to me earlier this week. Man, it has been wrecking my soul. How would my life look different if I really believed that God was a joyful father? How would my life look different if I really believed that God was a joyful father? If I see him as a genie or a general, you know what that's really going to hinder? It's going to hinder me going to this word. It's going to hinder me falling to my knees in prayer. Where are you in your prayer life right now? Do you see prayer as the ability to go to God and just ask him for a list of things or to tell him all the good things you've done for him? Or is it an opportunity to sit down at the table with your dad and have a conversation? Someone who is full of joy and love and mercy and grace and just wants to be with you. See, for me, I was thinking about this all week. How would my life look differently? Every day, every minute, my hobbies, how I spend my money, how I interact with my kids, how I interact with my wife. If I really saw God as a joyful father, I tell you what, I wouldn't be able to sit here and go like this while we're singing praises to the name of Jesus. I wouldn't be able to stand there and not proclaim the excellencies that scripture tells me to in scripture what is our posture in worship the bible tells us it it says make a joyful noise to the lord it's like well I, I i'm not a good singer it doesn't say make a good noise a joyful noise the bible says to raise our hands to clap to make music with instruments so we worship the Lord. We get to come to this place. Yeah, we get to come to this place and sing praises to the name of Jesus. Shouldn't that change how we, we engage with him when we're singing music, when we're reading the word together, when we're engaging in community with one another? We should long to be involved in the life of the family here. Not just here at FMCC, at FMCC, but in the, as a believer, as someone who believes in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you should long to be belong and believe with other believers so that you can be sharpened and pushed towards a loving Father. 
We should be praying over one another, seeking the Lord together. When we get together, do we open the word and see the beauty of his good news to us every time? If not, do we just continue to pursue it, pursue it, pursue it? See, this should change how we interact. This should change the life of our church. This is, should change us from hopping around to different places to find a thing that tickles our ears or, or feels good, but actually find a family to belong to. So where are you this morning? One, do you see God as a joyful father? And two, if you do, how, how has that affected, transformed your life? Not just Sunday morning. But when your wife and you argue and when you're disconnecting is your go-to to try to resolve it to figure out who's right so you can move on? Or is it to pray with one another, read the scriptures together, and just let the peace of God transcend all of your understanding? Do we desire to be the children of a joyful father? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for being the true older brother that we needed to come after us, to leave your inheritance, to leave your throne, and to come down, to live the life that we couldn't live, to die the death that we couldn't die, so that we may have life. God, thank you for the beauty of your gospel. And I pray that our lives would be transformed by you. We love you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.